Hi everyone and welcome back to the Southerners Northern Garden. So today I'm going to go over two things. One, I want to show you an update on the vegetable garden. Uh, I made it a priority before we had a lot of rain this week to pull up the old landscape fabric that I'd put down uh, four years ago or so and plant the mini clover in the area. And so I'm going to take you over there and show you that. But I also got my front fountain running. I posted a picture on Instagram the other day uh, and my story of like my front fountain needed to be restained. And I've never done that before. And so I didn't record the process, but I did say that I would, you know, talk about what I did and what materials I used to stain and reseal that. So we'll go up there after I show you the vegetable garden uh, and I'll walk you through those materials and I'll show you the clips that I recorded the other day setting it up. So the vegetable garden, uh, one of my goals this year was to be a better vegetable gardener. Um, I have not been the best vegetable gardener so far. Everything's doing pretty good, uh, but with all the other stuff I had to get in the ground, vegetable garden was kind of neglected. So I do have some stuff I still need to plant and some space I actually need to plant. Uh, but the other stuff is actually looking pretty good. So let's walk over there now and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I came out here Sunday and pulled up the landscape fabric. Uh, it only took a little less than an hour. Uh, it was cheap landscape fabric I'd purchased from Lowe's or Sam's or Costco or something several years ago. If you're going to use landscape fabric, I only recommend in areas uh, kind of like where I did between the fence and the arbor vitae where you're not going to be planting anything. Uh, and a very thin layer of mulch on top of it and use DeWitt, which is very uh, thick and weeds don't grow through as easily. I still wouldn't recommend it in the long run. It eventually has to be removed. So definitely nose in any flower beds, uh, but for a temporary solution, uh, it is a good alternative. But I got down the mini clover. So I've read about mini clover um, and it was something I wanted to try because I was having a lot of weed issues in this area specifically uh, because it was, the mulch had broken down so much over years. It had just become really pretty much fertile dirt. And so there were a ton of weed issues in the garden, uh, in the vegetable garden. And so I ripped out the landscape fabric and spread mini or micro clover. Uh, I think there may be a difference between micro and mini clover, um, but specifically micro clover stays super, super small. And clover is really good at like uh, adding nitrogen back to the soil. And so uh, after doing my research, um, I decided I wanted to try that in this area instead of just continuously mulching it. It's easy to be walked on. It holds up to like pet urine stains. People are incorporating it into their lawns these days, even with their grass. And so a lot of people are sometimes moving to a fully clover lawn, um, which is not my preference, but this micro clover incorporates really well from my understanding to your existing lawn helps feed the lawn because it produces that nitrogen uh, and provides additional shade cover for the ground for weeds. And it stays green, um, unlike some lawns which brown out in the summer. So it can be a good idea maybe to incorporate it into your existing lawn. The problem with micro clover is it can revert uh, back to like regular clover. And so regular clover becomes kind of invasive in my experience. And so this is, like I said, an experiment and we'll see how it goes. Uh, if I don't like it, I may end up having to come through and remove it as well, but we're just gonna give this a try this year. I spread this on Sunday, uh, it is Friday. I did not water it in after I spread it and it germinated within 24 to 48 hours. So I didn't water it in and the next day we had lots of rain on Monday. I feel like it rained nearly all day. Either way, we got a lot of rain. Uh, and that night or the next day, I noticed the seed had already germinated. And so it germinated really quickly. I went through two bags. Um, the company I got it from was just one I had Googled online. So I don't really have any recommendations, but it did germinate really well, but we'll see. But this is kind of how it looks like right now. It's just tiny, tiny. So I'm trying to stay off of it for now until it grows up a little better and becomes more walkable because all of the soil is really loose um, because it was on top of landscape fabric and so I had to pull it all off and it all got fluffed up. But the vegetable garden otherwise is looking pretty good. The peppers are starting to put on blooms. They were really stunted when I planted them this year, but some of them are catching up and doing pretty good. 
Uh, I've got some kohlrabi and some other uh, celeries and stuff in this bed. My basil did not make it this year, which is really odd. And then I have all of these dahlias that I planted, which every one of them that I planted has come up. Some have taken a little longer than others. And I did come through last week and pinch these, which means I just took the top portion off here. It can disrupt or delay your bloom time a little bit, but you're supposed to get stronger stems from that. I've never pinched my dahlias. I've never gotten around to doing it. Uh, and this year, since they're closer to the vegetable garden, uh, and more in eyesight when I walk around the garden. I was like, okay, I'll pinch them so I can keep a better eye on them. But they're looking really good and they're growing incredibly fast. So I hope we have some blooms here in the next uh, month or so. Dahlias can take a while to bloom out. I need to come through and the last remaining thing is to just clean up uh, this honeysuckle right now. Uh, it did get some aphid issues. Uh, but it doesn't look as bad as it has in previous years, but I need to just thin it out a little bit as these dahlias fill in. We have lots of kale and greens over here, which I find that I can grow kale all summer. Um, and it may be a little bitter, but I don't mind it uh, as a nice salad or to add to soups and stuff. Uh, but this is a ragged jack, I think, and it's looking really well. It's one of my favorites because it's really kind of tender. Uh, and I do have several other varieties, Scarlet, Lacinato. This is Red Mustard, I believe, which is really beautiful. I might plant some of this in the landscape for the fall. And this is a variegated horseradish, which is incredible. Last year, it didn't have any variegation. I bought it online. It's kind of a rare plant. Uh, and I'm thinking about pulling it in the fall and planting it in the landscape for some nice variegated leafy texture. Got some cucumbers growing that I had to reseed. And in the back corner there, which let's see if you can see it a little better over here. I've still got some weeds to pull up here. This is comfrey. And so I had to cut it down and this is what was left over because it was massive and overtaking some of these other vegetables here. So that comfrey specifically is Bocking 14, which is a sterile variety of comfrey. Um, if you have any other variety of comfrey, they can readily reseed themselves. And the thing about comfrey is it readily, like super readily, roots from like root cuttings. And so all of the comfreys I have came from root cuttings and they say to only plant comfrey where you want it forever. Because if you come in and dig it up, if you leave any root system, it will come back from the roots. And so um, I wouldn't necessarily consider it invasive if you know, if you purchase Bocking 14 and you're putting it where you know you want it to be. Now it does get a lot larger than I expected it to do. Uh, and so I have some in the mini orchard back there, but the nice thing about comfrey is it has a really deep root system. And so the benefits people use it for is to plant it, the root system goes down and gets all of these great nutrients that other plants may not be able to access. And then you come through and chop its leaves off Use the leaves as a mulch, which break down over time and add those nutrients back to the ground at a top layer. Or you can do like a comfrey tea and put it in water and let it um, steep, I guess, for you know a period of week. And pour that on your plants, vegetables, flowers, or spray it on there as like a annual foliar feed. So I just cut mine down because it was kind of in the way. I'm going to let it come back, but the ones I have in the mini orchard I might add to like five gallon buckets and let it brew um, for some nice comfrey tea to spread on my vegetable garden this coming year. Uh, so now that I've showed you the vegetable garden and how it is looking, I'm going to take you out front and show you the water fountain uh, and the products I use to restain it. Let's go take a look. So my method of restaining this, uh, I did a lot of research online initially and um, I was still kind of nervous about it. I didn't record the process of actually doing it uh, because I don't want to be showing you something that's incorrect. You can continue to watch throughout the seasons and if this holds up really well, you can do the same thing. But what I did do was I called the fountain place um, where I got it from, which locally is an aquatic garden center. Um, it's located north of Cincinnati and between Dayton and Cincinnati, kind of right there in the middle. But um, she, rec she said that Henry, which was the manufacturer of my fountain, has stain available. The color of this fountain is called Relic Ebony. 
Um, but she said there was very little uh, that they had in supply and they only sell it in like eight ounce bottles, which m I may have required a couple uh, of those bottles to refinish this entire fountain. I'm gonna show you a picture on the screen of what this looked like uh, before and after the first coat. And then I'll show you the final product here in a minute. But um, she recommended I go to Sherwin-Williams. They had discussed with Sherwin-Williams previously about customers restaining their fountains. And Sherwin-Williams had provided some recommendations. And so that's what I did. I went to Sherwin-Williams and picked up their concrete stain, which it's, um, it's not branded Sherwin-Williams, but it is what they sell. And I do think that they're the manufacturer of it. So it's H&C Interior Exterior Color Top Water Based Solid Color Concrete Stain. Now you could get a more transparent color. My fountain was a solid color previously, and it is in this tricorn black color, which is the darkest color Sherwin-Williams makes, I believe. Uh, tricorn black is the same color that we painted the um, shed trim, and so I knew I liked that color. It was really dark. And so now the fountain is darker, a little bit darker than it was originally. That relic ebony, had a little bit of brown kind of mixed in to make it a little more rustic look. And so I did two coats of stain, uh, very thin coats. The first one, I probably, if it wasn't as bad as it had been, I could have probably got away with one coat, but the calcification was so bad in some spots, it did require a second coat. So to prep it before I even started staining, I pressure washed it really well, knocked off all of that flaky um, calcification. We have really hard water uh, and the county's actually started treating the water, so hopefully we won't have this issue in the future. But previously it was really hard, and we would have a lot of calcification issues on water it, on water uh, features like this. So I pressure washed it, took some scrubbing um, cleaners, and tried to get off as much of this calcification as I could. What was left was just this powdery calcification. I stained directly over that after it was really clean, a thin layer waited until it was dry to the touch and then stained a second layer and at that point it was completely black and you couldn't see any of the um, calcification left over now i could have probably immediately turned around and sealed the fountain uh, sealing may have not have been necessary but when i got the fountain it had been sealed and it was a little shiny and so I was kind of nervous about that aspect of it because I didn't know what to get. The fountain company didn't really mention a sealant. So I went to Henry's website and Henry sells a spray fountain sealant um, for their fountains. So it's like a touch up kit that you can purchase. Well, I didn't purchase it from Henry because it was a little expensive, but I was like, if Henry's providing recommendations to use a spray sealant, that's what I'm going to use as well. And so I went and picked up this rock solid wet look lacquer uh, from Rust-Oleum high gloss. And I did two coats of it as well. Thin coats, this stuff will bubble up and drip if you're not careful. And so I did a really thin coat over the whole thing, including the base pedestal right there. Uh, and then after that dried, I did another coat on like the interior and the tiers here. I didn't do this right here because I was running out of this. So it took one entire bottle. There's a little bit left over in here, but it did a really good job and I'm impressed with it. So we'll see how it um, holds up this season. Right now you can see that it's repelling the water really well. Um, there's these little bubbles um, of water here that are not penetrating the concrete. And so it's doing really well. And so this is what it looks like final, which is 100% better than it did originally. Uh, now we're going to watch a short video of me assembling it and leveling out. I do have this fountain set up where it's easy to refill. I created a video on that last year, which I'll link below. Uh, but I don't ever have to drag a hose to this fountain. I have a switch I can flip over there on the water hose. The water travels under the ground through uh, this irrigation tube right here, which is just the black distribution drip tube up into the fountain and refills it for me every day so I don't have to drag a hose over here. I have enjoyed that for the past, I think it's been this way three years. The first year I got tired of dragging the hose out every day and putting it up because it does have to be refilled every day. And this has worked wonderfully. If you're interested in that method, I do have a video on it. Uh, it's not 
like super play by play, but it does tell you, give you a couple options depending on the size of your fountain that you can do. So let's get to looking at how I assembled this for the season. We did a really thorough job of leveling this fountain four years ago when we put it in. We took the time to put down a little bit of rock. It is sitting on a concrete pad, uh, but before I put the top two tiers on there today, I took a little level out to make sure it was level. Now the back side is not dripping perfectly correct, and so if you have a fountain, they will give you these little plastic wedges to insert in there uh, to kind of make sure it's flowing correctly because concrete's not perfect, the forms aren't perfect. So despite how level you think it is, after you get the water running, there may be some tinkering to do. So I'm going to adjust these uh, wedges right quick to see if I can get the water to flow more correctly off the back side. Uh, I'm really excited to have this project done for the year. It certainly looks 100% better uh, than it did. And I'm just really glad to have this up and running because it's later than usual. But you can see how crystal clear the water is. Uh, and how dark this looks now. The water is beating up on it from that sealant, which is what you're looking for. It's good to go. While you're with me right quick, we'll take a look at the containers up front. These are all looking really good so far. Most of them are coleus. Uh, this is not, this is an Alternanthera, I think it's called. Uh, and I did plant the caladiums in here. And I have started to see, now that it's getting really warm, um, some caladium shoots starting to emerge. So there's one right there. Caladiums love the heat. And so to the extent we have a cooler spring, they just have a really late start. So I didn't get those started earlier in the basement. They probably would not have sprouted in the basement anyway, because they, they like those really hot temperatures. Uh, one more to look at is this Pamela Crawford container that I have on a pedestal here. So the only petunias in my garden this year are these petunias I grew from seed. And so it's actually looking pretty good despite having just like random things thrown in there. We've got the decorative Kent's oregano, the petunias, these um, amaranth that I grew from seed are looking incredible. And they've actually gotten so heavy that they fell over and broke. Geraniums, nasturtium, She's looking really full, which is nice. It's just something different and something that didn't really cost me any money because I grew most all of this from seed. This bed right here is looking really incredible. The lavender hedge is uh, blooming out. And I want to show you this one other container right quick that's looking pretty darn good too. So we have the purple salvia in here from Proven Winners, more of that Kent's Beauty Oregano. Then we have this Toucan Yellow Canna Lily, which is just now getting started. It's putting off lots more leafy growth and there'll be more blooms to come. Not a whole lot, uh, but it is looking nice. I don't know about you, but I am probably going to spend the evening out here listening to my fountain now that it's up and running. 
Thank you guys for joining me. And remember, in a world full of hate, be a light. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye.